Canada is helping uh, lead the world. A lot what you're going to experience in Germany, what we're going to experience in the United States federally. Canada is really leading the way and experiencing the ups and downs and opportunities, obstacles, hurdles uh, ahead of everybody. So this panel will be providing some great oppor opportunities to uh, learn from people that have been through early stages everybody's going to go through. So I'm going to introduce the moderator. He'll take care of the rest of the panel. Um, he joined Med... Med Relief in 2014, and now he is the director of partner development for a new licensed producer called Flower out of British Columbia. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Alex Revich. Hello, everyone. Awesome to be back. Let's get our panel up here. First, I want to say, Willkommen, Danke für Shining. Is that okay? I had a little practice from last year. It's great to be back for my second time. Uh, last year was an awesome show, and I can already tell this is going to be even a better show. It has been already, and uh, it's not over yet. I uh, also want to give a special thanks to Alex Rogers and the organizers of ICBC. We can give a quick round of applause for, for Alex and ICBC and everything he's done. So before I introduce this awesome group of panelists, I want to give everyone a, a brief history of Canada. Uh, to put a little context into how we've come to where we are. Uh, it all started back in around 1999 when the first people started using cannabis for medical purposes. A lot of them were HIV patients from Toronto, uh, where I'm from. Uh, and I, I kind of describe it, if anyone's seen the movie Dallas Buyers Club, I don't know if anyone's seen it. If not, you should probably check it out. It's, it's really, the story is, people wanted to use it, it was helping them, and the, and the people said, and the government said, you know, let's do some more research on this, and we'll tell you if, if this is good. And they said, we don't have time, we're dying. We need this right now. So uh, they fought it up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court gave them the right to use cannabis, but they said, where am I supposed to buy this cannabis from? So they said, okay, we'll let you grow it. But a lot of people can't grow their own cannabis. So I don't know if you heard, it's not as easy as a lot of people think. So they allowed someone else to grow it for them as a designated grower, which had some issues with it, uh, with some designated growers growing a couple extra plants. Uh, by a couple extra plants, I mean a few thousand plants extra, and we're making a little money on the side. So that program died. Uh, that was called MMAR. And in 2014, they introduced MMPR, Medical Marijuana for Purposes, Regulatory Purposes, which is quite a mouthful. And uh, that allowed for licensed producers to sell the cannabis. But there wasn't enough cannabis at the time, so they allowed both programs to run simultaneously until 2016 when ACMPR, Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes Regulations, ACMPR, uh, allows for licensed producers and people to grow for their own and for cannabis oils, which were introduced in 2016. So just to give you a quick little snapshot of our industry, uh, when I started uh, about five years ago, there was less than 100 doctors prescribing. We now have over 11,000 doctors prescribing. So your challenges about doctors not prescribing, we know, we feel it. We have some thoughts on why that is and how you can overcome it, which we'll talk about. Uh, also, we currently have around 400,000 patients and over 30 licensed sellers of cannabis and over a, a, almost 100 licensees but a lot of those licensees are owned by some cannabis companies. So it's, don't be fooled. It's not that there's 100 separate companies. Uh, some companies have multiple licenses. And just some market data, there's around 2,000 kilograms a month sold. This is from December, from Health, from Health Canada. One thing we're very lucky that Health Canada provides us stats and data, where I know in Germany there's a lot of challenges to find out what the information is on how much is going on. In Canada, they're giving it to us. It's a little outdated, but it's better than nothing. So from December, around 2,000 kilograms a month sold and 3,000 kilograms of oil. Around 114,000 shipments are done a month in December. Um, and we're busy gearing up for legalization and exporting it and all that kind of stuff because as of December, there was 38,000 kilograms in inventory. So definitely lots in inventory and 11,000 kilograms of oil. The average script size is about 2.4 grams. Someone was asking me the other day what the average script size, so I just wanted to let everyone know. It's about 2.4 grams. Now, uh, really excited to introduce these panelists over here. Got a great panel who know a lot about business. Uh, we'll start with uh, the founder of Emblem, one of my good friends, Max Zavitt. Hello, everybody. It's great to be back in Berlin. Uh, I was here last year for the ICBC conference, and it's great to see uh, that uh, it's back this year, and it's growing, and there's still a lot of interest uh, 
uh, in this market, uh, especially what's gone on with uh, some of the uh, German regulations. Uh, quickly about Emblem, we're a publicly traded uh, company in Canada. We've been licensed since 2015. Uh, started trading on the TSXV in 2016. We have three main verticals. We have Emblem Health that seeks to, to focus on uh, medical uh, and novel-like dosage forms that are more akin to pharmaceutical products like oral sprays, uh, tablets, oils, gel caps. Uh, we have uh, Emblem Rec that we're launching, which will service the recreational market in Canada with, uh, with a house of brands. Um, and we also have a, a key uh, component with that through our educational arm called GrowWise, which provides a nexus between the, the patients and, and healthcare professionals in cannabis. Awesome. Thank you, Max. Uh, next on our panel is Phil Campbell. He's the CEO of Ascent Industries. Thanks, Alex. It's great to see such a great turnout here in uh, Berlin at the ICBC. Uh, I'm the CEO of Ascent. Ascent is a global cannabis company. We're focused on the emerging cannabis opportunity in any market that has a regulated opportunity. So we're licensed in Canada, Oregon, and Nevada, and we're pursuing licensing in a number of other markets as well. We focus on consumer experiences and creating brand loyalty and connection with our consumers to create uh, brand value with the products that we sell. And we do that all backed in science. So we have a number of scientists, 15 scientists on staff, and we do everything with validated pro proper methodologies. We are pursuing a public listing in the next uh, couple of months, and we uh, look forward to entering the German market in the, in the years ahead. All right, awesome. Thank you, Phil. And uh, the next person I can tell you in Canada would need no introduction. He's uh, quite a well-known figure in the Canadian cannabis industry for many, many years. Uh, he's currently the CEO of Wheaton Income, and he does many other things, which I'm sure he'll tell you about. Chuck Rafici. Thanks, Alex. So Chuck Rafici, uh, some might know me as the co-founder of uh, Canopy Growth. Uh, certainly, um, uh, it's a very exciting industry. You know, with uh, Wheaton Income, company started uh, less than a year ago, partnered with uh, you know, arguably some of the uh, other industry experts in Canada, uh, top regulatory uh, firm and lawyers, and really looked at how we could uh, innovate the, the production platform, uh, really been building out and, and, and uh, building out and putting shovel to ground on a lot of production capacity in Canada, and now we're moving on to uh, IP creation, uh, kind of midstream value, and now looking at distribution deals internationally. Uh, so we've um, uh, still have some catching up on the production side, but we're really excited about the uh, global market and working, uh, working to build out the Wheaton uh, production platform. Uh, also chairman of National Access Cannabis, uh, which was one of the first four companies uh, to get a private uh, retailing license in Canada. Uh, and, uh, and lastly, through a private equity from Nesta, uh, we've launched a European uh, fund targeting institutional investors to invest in ancillary businesses in the cannabis space. So uh, lots going on, a lot of excitement. Great to be here. Awesome, thanks Chuck. And uh, again, as everyone told you, I'm Alex Revich. I'm with a company called Flower. We're a grower out of Kelowna, BC. I'm going to be hopefully importing here to uh, Germany for our GMP facility. And I'm very focused on education, which has been a theme last year and this year, and create an education program. So welcome to come and talk to me about that. But you're not here to talk about education right now. You're talking about business and how to make money. And you got some of the best people to talk to about that. So uh, I promise I'm going to leave time for questions because I think that's really important. I'm sure a lot of you already have some questions and maybe some more after this discussion. Uh, so the first question we're going to talk about are what are some of the early challenges and how are we able to overcome it uh, in Canada? Um, if you want to start us off, Max. Sure. I mean, uh, challenges, of course, regulation, which is something uh, uh, everybody in Germany is, is clearly aware of. Um, Money uh, was, is a challenge, although uh, the, the notion now that in Canada um, there's a lot of money and, and it's no problem to, to raise money, but still you need to have a really solid business um, in order to do that. And in the early days when the market was just developing and it was medical only and it was under uh, conservative government, um, it, there were times where it was extremely difficult to, uh, to raise money and to build these very capital intensive facilities. Uh, that required a lot of uh, uh, capital expenditure as well as operational expenditure. So those are definitely the two, two biggest challenges um, that are going to be happening in this German market as well. All right. Phil, Chuck, any thoughts? Phil? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Those are the two biggest challenges that are dealing with the, the regulator and also access to capital. I think as you enter into the German market, some of the things that you're going to want to do 
is to really educate yourself on the process, really go through the regulations front to back and understand everything very thoroughly and uh, get consultants if you need to in order to, to make sure you have a full understanding and get in front of it early. Uh, get your application in early, work with the regulator, create a very uh, friendly relationship with them and always make sure that you have access to capital because that is a very capital intensive project and uh, yeah, I mean, kind of echoing thoughts, uh, certainly need to embrace the regulations, as we know. Uh, and I think um, you know, getting out early, being a first mover, early mover, um, means you're going to have deal with a lot more uncertainty. But, you know, I think this industry uh, rewards early movers uh, far you know, greater than, than anything else I've seen. So you'll, it'll always be worth the additional trouble. And the regulatory bar always increases over time. Uh, you know, becoming a, a licensed producer, uh, you know, when we filed in, in, in 2013, was far easier than it is to today, and the application gets gets deeper as the regula regulator learns how to how to process. So that's um, that's certainly key, and and that kind of comes down to kind of the the main point. Uh, I think the challenge is that you got to remember that cannabis. I think the opportunity is a great business opportunity, but it's a political issue above all else, and and politics will often trump good policy. And so if you don't if you don't embrace that there's a political uh, mix to this, uh, the calculus, uh, then you're gonna you know you're gonna be uh, not going to enjoy yourself. Yeah. No, excellent point. And even on, on the regulatory thing, just to point out, we were here last year, the tender for Germany just came out, and there was a lot of excitement. And in Canada, even though it seems pretty perfect from an outside world, here we are five years later, I can assure you when the regulations first came out, a lot of people were quite upset and threatened to sue the government. So we went through the same challenges, and it just takes time to expand. And here we are five years later. So that's a good point. And you mentioned about raising money. Uh, that's a very hot topic right now with so many publicly traded companies. Uh, here in Canada, in, uh, listing in Canada, and there's even some American companies. Just to give you some stats from Bloomberg, as of January, there were 84 publicly traded companies, uh, and there was it was worth around 37 billion dollars. Uh, as well, U.S. companies are now listing in Canada because Canada allows for for cannabis listings, although Frankfurt as well. And we have a lot of American companies, and even one Canadian company which got listed on the Nasdaq, uh, and. Just want to point out, it is a good time to buy. Uh, they are at a four-month low, uh, and I'm not going to ask these guys which companies they recommend to buy, since uh, a couple of them are public and one might be soon as well. So, uh, but we will talk about what are some of the challenges of going public, and how do you know when the right time is to go public? Well, I think uh, when you know Tweed was the first company to, to be publicly traded in Canada, the TSX Venture Exchange, and the time that we did it. It was actually our thinking was uh, because of the advertising restrictions. Uh, we didn't do it for capital reasons. Uh, I think the whole industry at that time underestimated the capital requirements, uh, and we, we did it more for publicity. Uh, you know, might be able to advertise your public company, etc. It was an advantage. Now, uh, luckily, you know, we we had a vehicle. Many other companies now in Canada are public, and um, I think the uh, you know obviously the opportunity is having a currency and, uh, and being able to move fast because of the speed of the industry. Um, I think it, it disproportionately rewards uh, uh, people with, with pu access to public funds. And I think the challenges are, um, you know, with that, uh, you, do get, uh, you do get constrained. And I think a challenge in Canada for, for publicly traded companies, at least on the, on the TSX venture and the TSX, is that we can't play in the U.S. And so we, uh, there's a tremendous amount of deal flow and opportunities that we see uh, in the United States that, that we can't touch, that other competitors can. And so uh, it's interesting to see how that develops. Uh, but certainly, you know, the global market is, is providing a great counterbalance to that. Yeah, I, I would say if you're pursuing a public listing, the biggest thing now with 84 public companies, and there's a few more in the pipeline, by the end of the year it'll be over 100, is yep. to ensure that you have something that really differentiates your story from other cannabis companies. You don't want to be just another story amongst a, a sea of stories. You want to have something compelling for investors to believe in and to, to put their money behind. You don't want to have a, a business that's just a generic cannabis company with, with just hopes and dreams. You want to have something tangible, something real that investors can, can get behind. So I think that's the biggest thing if you're pursuing a listing and, now. Uh, and Phil, anyone else going public on the stage uh, soon? Yeah, we're, uh, we're in the process of going public. We should be listed in June on the CSC. Uh, cool. As Chuck mentioned, we do have assets in the United States, so we have to pursue a listing on the CSC rather than some of the other uh, exchanges. So. He gets to all the fun opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Ma Max, some thoughts on going yeah, public? Uh, uh, I know you do. Yeah, when, when I started uh, Emblem back in 2013, not in my wildest imaginations that I think uh, we're going to have to be a publicly traded company or that a cannabis company can even be a publicly traded company, let alone... Um, so I guess I was a bit naive and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the reason you do go public, of course, is to provide your investors with liquidity. Um, and when you're raising money and the amount of money that you have to raise for, for this space, 
uh, in order to build out your cultivation facilities and your operations, uh, you, you need to give back to the investors um, and, and that's why you, you do go public. Uh, but if you don't have to and you can stay private, I mean, uh, I, I personally uh, uh, would rather do that, but I also understand the need uh, uh, for going public and, and why Canadian companies and other companies are doing so. I think some of the, the, the race, I think, you know, the, the fear uh, that, you know, even as a publicly traded Canadian company, having that currency access to capital, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the top 10 Canadian companies are, are raising 100 million Canadian just kind of every now and then when the market conditions are right, not the last couple of weeks. But, you know, the real fear for me is the, you know, the, the U.S. has given the cane industry a huge gift through, pro, through the illegality at a federal level. But, you know, that, that will eventually change. And we see a uh, former Speaker of the House uh, kind of endorsing cannabis. And once the institutional taps open in the U.S., um, you know, we're going to have a lot of competition. So, you know, I think we always uh, feel the urgency, uh, I think, to continue uh, scaling because although... Uh, we've had a great amount of scaling that's taken place. Uh, you know, the industry globally is still in its infancy, so it's still it's still a race. I think that's the challenge and the opportunity for everybody here is that although Canadian companies have a, I think a, a great start, uh, it's still really early. And just on that note, uh, everyone always talks about going public as just a license to print money, and there's all this excitement around it. Can anyone just touch on a few challenges? Like, what are the negatives? Because uh, if anyone's really thinking like, oh, it's all great, uh, if anything you can publicly <laughs> yeah. talk about uh, of hey, it might not be as sweet as you think. Oh, for sure. Well, once, once you go public, you're under the microscope um, and you have shareholders and you have shareholders uh, from all walks of life and you have a lot of retail uh, investors that are, are just looking to make money and, and flip your stock um, and they don't understand that, you know, everything takes time uh, and, you know, we're trying to build a real business at Emblem um, and we, we do have a real business and we have revenue and we have great products coming out and we have great marketing and branding, but it may not be reflective of our share price. Uh, while there are other companies who have higher valuations that don't have a nickel in sales. Uh, you know, so you have to take it with a, with a grain of salt and obviously being under that microscope, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people uh, contact myself and, and our CEO and, and sometimes leave us nasty emails about things, but that's just because they don't understand what we're doing and they're not taking the time to really understand uh, the industry as a whole uh, and they're just looking to make a quick buck. So. Yeah, oh, that's an excellent point. I don't know if anyone else has to add, but... Yeah, I think some of the, uh, the considerations are obviously the transparency at being under the microscope, uh, and also that there's a significant cost associated with it, not just a financial cost, but also a human capital cost. It takes a lot of resources in order to pursue a public listing and maintain that listing, and that does put a burden on the management team. So if you are able to stay private and access capital and your shareholders are comfortable with that, and that's certainly something worth considering because it, it allows the management team to focus more on the business and less on uh, the public aspect of the business, which is itself a, a separate business entirely almost. So certainly something to consider is if you can stay private, it does give you more flexibility to, to pivot and, and stay nimble in the, in the industry, which is a terribly complex one and there's lots of emerging opportunities. So having that flexibility could be beneficial for some companies. Yeah, I think you see the check sizes on private deals getting larger uh, with more global interest. So I think you can stay private a little bit longer. Uh, but certainly, I think, uh, you know, certainly our, you know, our, our experience and soon your experience is um, given the speed at which the industry is evolving, I, I still believe that the default choice is to try to access the, the capital markets. Uh, but once you do that, you, are, you need to scale. There's no point in going public and not having a subsequent raise. So when you're going public, you're taking on that burden. You now need to, you know, you need to scale probably by another factor of 10 to make, to make that, that gamble worth it and, then, uh, and sometimes lose control of your board. Yeah, yeah no, excellent points. Uh, <laughs> and I, I can tell you, uh, for the longest time, every time I'd go somewhere, people would love to ask me a question about cannabis use, what's good for my grandmother, or what strain or variety I'd recommend. And I used to love that, but now a lot of times I tell them what industry I'm in, and they're like, oh, what stock should I invest in? And it gets kind of uh, annoying that way, but I can't imagine what it's like for you guys. I got a party, and it's like, what the hell? I invested in you yesterday, and I'm down. What, what the hell is going on? Well, you can't recommend your own stocks. I say, buy his. Yeah. <laughs> I was on a family vacation, and I, uh, I made the error of tweeting it, and I got a, uh, a tweet response oh, from, <laughs> from, uh, from someone, I guess, who was a shareholder, and said, how can you be taking vacation when your stock is on its way down? You know, and yeah. it's like, geez. Uh, yeah. People are harsh. Uh, <laughs> Very harsh. And I think the best lesson for this is that it's a long game. Someone said yesterday, and I say the same thing, it's a marathon, it's not a race. And if you bought something hoping that you're going to sell it tomorrow, I don't think any of these guys have any uh, 
tears for you. Uh, it's, it's more of like a long-term game. If you believe in the business, you invest and you hold on until it comes to fruition. So uh, some excellent points. And uh, the last question before we get into your questions is about other cool businesses that you like. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, different ancillary products uh, on the side. It's, all, it's not only about cannabis. I'm sure you probably have heard this expression. If you haven't, it's used a lot in Canada. But uh, they talk about the miners, and it wasn't only the miners that were getting the gold that made a lot of money. It was the, the businesses that supported them, like the jeans, the picks, the shovels. So that's a very common expression. So maybe we can take a moment to just talk about it. I, uh, I can start it off. Uh, I saw there was a cool business that buys up land and leases it back. Uh, there's a few companies like Plant Properties and a few. Uh, I'm a big vaporizer guy. This is one I really like I can, out of Canada called uh, Airizer. If you want to come check it out, come up to me after. I've been showing it off uh, all this time in Berlin. I'm a big fan. Uh, so those are some cool side businesses, uh, other things that support cannabis that I'm excited about. And maybe you guys can talk about some of the things that excite you and give them a little inside scoop. Sure. Um, you know, at, at Emblem, although cultivation is a big part of what we do, we're actually uh, reshifting our focus away from cultivation and into more of the value add uh, products, um, derivatives and, and concentrates and uh, pharmaceutical like products. Um, as well, we're focusing on, on brands because that's where the higher margins are going to exist. Ultimately, uh, you know, cultivation, uh, as, as more and more uh, operations come online, the price of those operations are going up, but the price of the product is ultimately going down. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there are tons of uh, ancillary businesses, and even as a licensed producer who produces cannabis products, you know, you, you have to think beyond just cultivation. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. <clears throat> for, for us, what we're focused on now is uh, taking what we've learned on the small to medium scale and some of the smaller markets like Oregon and Nevada and, and industrializing those processes and using automation. So taking uh, things that are done semi-automatically using some, some vape pen fillers and, and other automated processes, but combining them so that it's fully automated so that you can actually access a, a truly national and international market. So taking uh, something that's been done in Oregon, it's only 4 million people. So you can't really justify the expense of putting in a fully automated packaging line. Uh, whereas in Canada, there's you know 37 million people. We have the opportunity to export. And so our focus now moving into the next year is automating the processing so that we can truly create large volumes of products to be able to service that national and international opportunity. And I think that's going to be something that really uh, differentiates us as we move forward because a lot of companies are focused on large scale uh, cultivation facilities, which we're also doing ourselves. We have a 60,000 square meter greenhouse, but we have a 4,000 square meter manufacturing facility and that's going to really enable us to, to create millions of units a month. Uh, the other thing that I'm excited about as far as technology, uh, as far as emerging opportunities is, is in technology. So we've invested into an enterprise resource planning software. So it tracks all of the different costs and other metrics, everything that happens in our business gets put into this dashboard and scrubs all the information and presents it in a very uh, user-friendly interface. So we have real-time business intelligence to make sensible decisions with. And that database, as it continues to grow and, and, uh, and build, will allow us to take that information and, and be able to enter new markets um, in a more timely manner with more sophistication and, and more information behind us. Those are the things that we're excited about. Well, Chuck, I know you've you got yeah. lots, lots of things to be excited about. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, a specific uh, ancillary product that I uh, like is the data that we now see. I mean, a shout out to a company that I'm a customer of, BDS Analytics out of Colorado. Mm -hmm. They have great market segmentation, uh, you know, by, uh, by brand, by SKU. Uh, you know, they charge, they charge well for it, but uh, it's, it's great data. So as you look to develop your, your own products and attack the market, it's, um, there's great sources like that developing because I think, uh, you know, the value is in brands over time, uh, but, you know, my, my thesis is that, you know, right now you can have the best brand in the world, the best consumption device or, uh, or product, but unless you have the input materials to create that product, you're not going to go anywhere. So people that control brands today are the ones that have cultivation, but we know that that will shift. And so uh, you see a lot of the, you know, current people with a lot of production shifting to licensing uh, IP or creating IP uh, to create that brand value. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of shifting, I think, in Canada to, uh, you know, most, most companies have the cultivation that they want or at least that they want to have in kind of in the queue being built. And now it's about where they're going to put that, that cultivation to get higher margins. I'm a huge fan of vape pens. I think that is, a, the, I think that'd be the most important segment uh, in the market. Uh, some jurisdictions aren't allowing it yet. Uh, Canada, that we don't know when uh, it'll come, but I think it's, a, it's an amazing consumption method and it's really going to, uh, I think that's the biggest threat to alcohol in my view. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, a lot of people are talking about that. And just a quick technology, since you were mentioning technology, there's a company I know that uh, me and Emblem work with uh, called Strain Print, 
And what they do is they analyze people's results from the cannabis, so it make it a lot easier. It, can, it picks all the data, puts it together, and then it makes it easier for other people to decide what strains are right for them, uh, and it allows them to make recommendations. So it's a good way to analyze the data of what your patients are using to have a better idea of what uh, your patients want and need. Uh, so that's a cool technology. And you mentioned also something else that's a danger. And here in Germany, you might be sh surprised to learn, I heard how expensive the cannabis is here in Germany. And uh, yeah, it's really unfortunate, uh, but things are going to change. Uh, what's happening in Canada, we're having almost people are saying it's like a commodity price. Uh, it's right now oil is becoming kind of a commodity and, and some people are saying that. But uh, I don't know if anyone can just quickly talk about how do you prevent from the pr being a commodity. And again, here in Germany, because it might be unfathomable to you to think, because it's selling for so expensive here, it might be difficult to comprehend. But here in Canada, the pressure is on the price to go down. How do we prevent uh, that? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> especially in the recreational market in Canada, the provinces are going to have a lot of buying power. The, the way that it's set up in Canada is the province are, is responsible for distribution. So they're going to be buying from the licensed producers. They have to build in two sets of margins. They have a wholesale margin and a retail margin. So that means that the price that they end up paying is going to be around 2 to $3 per gram. And we just have to look at the alcohol industry and see that that's the same case. If you buy a $20 bottle of wine from, from a provincial retailer, the, the winery actually gets about $4 or $5 out of that. So they're getting 20 or 25% of the retail price. The estimated retail price in Canada is about $10, so assuming the same uh, happens in the cannabis industry, it's going to be at about $2 to 250 once the market matures. Initially, there's going to be a lack of supply, so I think that the prices will stay high for the first year or two. But inevitably, once that oversupply does hit the market, there's going to be a significant price compression, and that's going to have producers that are just focused on flour, they're going to be very, uh, they're going to see their margins erode because they are going to have a lot of price compression, a lot of uh, pressure from other producers to, to meet the revenue targets as public companies. And so I think the best way for companies to try to avoid that is to focus on the value-added products, just like Emblem's doing in ourselves, uh, because you're able to take those input materials, and as that price comes down, it actually means that those producers, their margins are going to erode, our margins are going to increase because our input costs are going to come down. Uh, we're going to be able to source from other producers, we're not going to be able to supply everything ourselves for our, for our output, so I think that positions our companies very well in, in that uh, eventual economic situation. Yeah, I think you know we see uh, uh, on the, uh, the product side. Although the the raw input material can get commoditized, you know we have uh, you know one producer in Canada, Hydropothecary, selling a, a spray, and I think the the per gram equivalent price of that spray uh, ends up being about I think it's sixty or seventy dollars a gram. So when you turn your pro when you go actually and productize your cannabis, uh, you get a lot of there's a lot of margin that can be compressed. So I think that's a very interesting thing. But certainly, you know, on the rec market, that's the last place I want to put my product because uh, you're going to get squeezed. You're getting intermediated with a wholesaler and a retailer. Uh, the first place you want to put product is the medical market in Canada, but that's a small market. Then it goes to really places like Germany. The international medical markets are the best markets. Uh, so I think you're, you know, you, as Canadian companies, you want to be. We're all we're all looking to pursue those international opportunities because that that is the best opportunity for us. And just to echo um, some, some thoughts you, you guys made, yeah, definitely to differentiate, you want to be a higher quality producer, I think. Um, you want to have unique products. And another thing uh, that you can't overlook look is uh, you have to uh, have strength in distribution. So, uh, you know, Emblem has a, has a partnership with a very large uh, pharmacy chain in, in Canada called Shoppers Drug Mart, um, and where we have a few other uh, distribution arrangements. And, and I know Chuck's involved with National Access that is also focusing on distribution. So, you know, having the right retail partners and the relationships with those retail partners and distribution points, even though some of them are provinces, is going to be extremely important as well. And uh, National Access just uh, signed a deal with a big uh, coffee shop uh, chain in Canada. Just read that uh, on the news. Yeah, it's nice to see coffee going to pot. It's a good, uh, it's a good change. Yeah, yeah. Pot it's of a coffee. Yeah, and yeah. Tokyo Smoke. Who, who and thought it's very popular so uh, in Canada, mixing <laughs> coffee and cannabis. Uh, I don't know if they actually mix it together, but you can do both in the same spot. I don't, I don't think they're going to allow it yet, but uh, it'll get there. It'll get yeah, there. The, the concept is there. So mm -hmm. great, uh, great discussion. I, I felt it was really important to leave time to, for questions. Uh, I feel like we always run out of time for questions, so I wanted to leave a good amount of time. Uh, so open it up. Uh, well done. Let's questions. hear it for the panel. Coffee, uh, I don't know if this translates, but in, uh, in America we call coffee and cannabis the hippie speedball. Yikes. It's <laughs> a whole new meaning for coffee pot. Like to see right. Coffee pot is pretty good. Picks you up and calms you down. 
Thanks very much for sharing your experiences. Yesterday we heard from an importer into Germany of Canadian products how important it was to have clinical studies. I was wondering whether you have any experience with clinical studies in Canada that could perhaps stand up to the standard that could prov provide a medical benefit claim. So we, we will be venturing into clinical studies. Uh, through our educational arm um, and uh, clinic operation GrowWise, we, we have been doing a lot of observational trials and, and uh, have been collecting data uh, through the patients there on, on their experience with cannabis and different strains they use. Uh, but yes, clinical trials is, is something that's going to become more important, especially if you want to export, and especially if you want to really legitimize uh, cannabis um, as, as, a, as a drug that's uh, distributed like, like other drugs. So uh, we don't have, I don't have any direct experience with it yet, but it's, it's something that our, our company will be focusing on um, in the next little bit. I think I think certainly there there are uh, a number of uh, a number of uh, institutions and companies that uh, do work on clinical studies in Canada. I think uh, you know one I'm familiar with is at National Access Cannabis. Uh, you know, being a clinic model, uh, direct patient interaction. Uh, clinics in Canada have really been the ones that have been driving the uh, you know the physician engagement with patients for people to get access to the medical system. But uh, it's opiate reduction. I think that's um, the anecdotal evidence is I think is pretty overwhelming yeah, on topic, uh, yeah. reducing opiates with cannabis, but uh, those studies, there's a number of opiate reduction and replacement studies uh, taking place. I think that'll be uh, a huge key. You know, pain physicians have been the most open to prescribing cannabis, uh, you know, because they know they know what the alternative is. Um, and when, when those clinical studies get results, I think we'll see, it'll be a great tool, especially for new markets, to really break through the, uh, the medical uh, taboo barrier. Yeah. Yeah, well, we just started two weeks ago a preclinical trial to, to study the effects of cannabinoid therapy on heart arrhythmias and Dravet syndrome, so a type of seizure. And so we're just starting that research now, and uh, we're hoping to get some results by the end of the year, which will help to, to guide a, a more formal clinical trial. And so that's uh, already underway, and then we're pursuing a couple of other clinical trials as well under a few other different disease states. So that'll be coming forward in the next few months. Yeah, Chuck, you touched on something, a uh, big crisis in Canada right now. We have an opiate crisis. Around 4,000 people died last year. It's already accelerating this year. Uh, what I find interesting, I'm learning a lot about the German, uh, that they're very chemical culture. There's a lot of drugs being used in Germany. But when I talk about opiates, it's not, it doesn't seem like it's such a problem. I don't know if it's something that is going to happen or somehow Germany can avoid it. But uh, it's a big problem in Canada and finding uh, that cannabis can be used as a, either complementary so don't use as much opiates or, or in, as a replacement. I think that could be huge. But just the thing I want to point out also, when people say there's not enough research, because I hear that all the time, I tell them to go to a website called PubMed. P-U-B-M-E-D, uh, type in the word cannabis and notice the 20,000 plus articles of, of uh, research there uh, and then tell me that there's no research. I mean, that there's tens of research, maybe not as what some of you like, but uh, there's lots there. And uh, I believe in collaboration for research. I hope we all can do collaboration. There's no point of us investing in our own research because it's going to help us all. It's about working together as producers and then worldwide. Who's doing something in Germany? Who's doing something in Toronto? How do we work together? We've seen PTSD trials, pain trials out of McGill by Dr. Mark Ware, uh, who's doing some great stuff in Canada with the CCIC, the uh, Canadian Cannabinoid Investigative Consortium. Uh, so it's really important, the research. So uh, thanks, very good question. Another you, question? Yeah, uh, in a minute, but I just want to, to your point where uh, the opiate, and there have been studies in America that in states that have legal marijuana, opiate yeah. overdoses and opiate deaths go down 25%. Absolutely. Right, That's and so exciting. They're, they're realizing that uh, cannabis isn't a gateway to harder drugs, but it's a pathway away. Right, it's, I, say, it's, I like to say it's an exit drug, not a, not a, that, and also something to point out that not only does opiate use go down, but uh, suicide goes down, physical abuse, alcoholism, so a lot of other ills uh, go down as well. Um, what, uh, what role do you see for economic development, economic development agencies? So I'm from one of the provinces uh, here, and we've been very focused on, uh, on this industry, so just your thoughts which, on that. Which province? Uh, New Brunswick. Oh, welcome. Thoughts? I mean, great to see New Brunswick here. They're really taking a leadership role. I met with uh, several individuals from uh, no other province uh, seems to be attending these events. So it's... Uh, Any other know, provinces here? Anyone? No. Oh, <laughs> we've got one here. Nice. Well, you, know, okay. we have, you know, we have 10 provinces, a few territories, but it's, um, I think it speaks to the fact that most of our, uh, our, our local governments and, and, and provincial governments are not really engaged on this file. They're being forced 
uh, by, by the federal mandate. Uh, the Canadian system started through the courts. We have a federal government that is very pro, or at least that is going through with legalization. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's a lot more engagement to be had. I think we see uh, actually New Brunswick providing job grants and hiring grants, really normalizing the industry. So I think the, the opportunity is to um, keep engaging with government through traditional channels uh, for, for, you know, whether it's tax credits or other innovation funds to, uh, to, to normalize that. But it's a, it's a slow process. Through my experience, it really can vary province to province. Um, and I, I think, uh, again, from my experience, one of the most forward-thinking provinces uh, in cannabis uh, is Alberta, and their economic development teams are, are quite interested, especially in the city of Calgary, uh, where you know, uh, they want a, a economic diversity because it's a very uh, natural resource-heavy economy. Um, and, 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 and it's very nice to see uh, provinces that are supporting cannabis and not uh, trying to shut the door or make it more complicated than it already is. I think just going to the, you know, to the European uh, sector, I think the, uh, and those conversations will be few and far between here, uh, you know, as far as dealing with officials, but I think it's a great time to start building those bridges, making those connections. Uh, you're not going to get anywhere, but uh, there's far few people knocking on those doors. So I think now's the time to really just just start that process uh, and engaging with your, your local officials uh, and going back to the political issue. You know, you want to be known to those officials when, uh, when the starting gun goes off in whatever jurisdiction you're in, uh, making sure that uh, people know you and you've been able to use, use lobbying or, or engaging with officials as a point of credibility to accelerate your business plans. Yeah, lobbying, that's uh, not a swear word. Uh, it's something that needs to be done and uh, done right, look it up. That's right, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Phil, did you have something yeah, to say? I, I would say that I'd really encourage people to engage their economic development uh, teams within whatever jurisdiction they're in. It is a very capital intensive industry, so if there's any uh, help that different um, regions can offer companies, then that certainly is uh, very beneficial for, for cannabis companies. It helps to offset a lot of the cost, whether it's through some tax incentives, credits, and so forth. Um, Additionally, it's really great for the local economies because there is a lot of uh, jobs being created. And I think that the, the biggest challenge is on the regulatory front. So forging that relationship with people who are in government and in, in with the regulator can be very beneficial strategically for your company. So I'd really encourage it for, for anybody who's considering it. Yeah, and uh, New Brunswick, you should be really proud. I hear uh, they're doing some great things there to support businesses because uh, it creates a lot of jobs and a lot of good paying jobs. So uh, it's really smart to uh, support these types of businesses. And just quickly, you know, where you're located in Canada uh, is very important and Emblem's located in, in lovely Paris, Ontario. That's right, Paris, um, Ontario. <laughs> it doesn't look anything like Paris, France. Um, Nothing like it. But, you know, what, what's important is we're very close to the municipal uh, government there. They're very supportive. We couldn't have asked for, for, a, for a better um, a supportive uh, local government than we have in Paris, Ontario. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right, well, time for one quick one and then. Okay. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is uh, Harry. Um, just uh, wondering, you were talking earlier about uh, one of the challenges being uh, getting capital uh, to grow your business. Uh, at the same time, uh, we see market valuations uh, that recognize we had in the dot-com uh, age 17, 18 years ago. What are your views on the risk that the money coming into this business is creating uh, a green bubble? Green, green bubble? I don't know if I've heard that one before. Nice. I, I would say that there's a lot of money, institutional money in the United States and uh, elsewhere in the world that's still sitting on the sidelines waiting for the industry to develop. We're still in the early stages of the, of the industry, so there's still a lot of growth opportunity. So once that money does uh, come into the industry, it's going to continue to drive uh, share prices up and continue to appreciate the valuation of these companies. Canada is positioned very favorably in the world because we do have access to an export market. So it's not just based on our domestic Canadian market, but we do have that early mover advantage into other markets. So I still see a lot of upside moving forward into the, uh, the years ahead as the, the companies continue to develop. I think that if you're going to be investing, invest long term. If you're looking for short term picks, then, uh, you know, that's your day trading and, and really at the end of the day, what's important is to pick your horse and, and to mm -hmm. pick your jockeys and, and support them and don't get caught up in the day-to-day because -day. everybody's focused on the last month or two how the prices have been so volatile but they forget about the run-ups that, that have happened for the last couple of years and sure there's a short-term uh, trough where things have come down and, and corrected perhaps a little bit but the the trend is upwards you know you look at the charts for the last couple of years and they're, they're only going in one direction aside from this short-term 
um, pullback we've had in the last couple of months. But I really see that the, the upside opportunity is still tremendous for cannabis companies. Yeah, and it's still more solid than cryptocurrency. So, ah. <laughs> sorry, sorry yeah, if any crypto guys out there. Just a little. There goes little my whole pot coin yeah. business. Yeah. 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 Uh, that already exists. Uh, do we have more time for questions? Or that was it. Uh, all right, we're going to be around, uh, so feel free to come up and uh, talk to us. We love talking about cannabis and Canada, so we're all very friendly guys. So come say hi. Thanks for having us here again. Thanks. Let's hear it again.